Okay, and I'm back once again with Reading with the Sims. I'm reading, uh, once again, still reading Dealing with Dragons um, by Patricia C. Reedy. Um, sorry I haven't, sorry I missed last week. Um, as um, if anyone's been watching my other videos, um, my grandfather passed away on the 3rd. Um, last Thursday, um, last Wednesday, um, and last Thursday I spent the afternoon with my family, well, the early afternoon. And for anyone wondering, no, it was not COVID that took my grandfather. Um, it was a congenital heart disorder, um, high blood pressure. Um, a couple of months ago, he had a, a, a few months ago, he had a mild heart attack. He had a mild heart attack and a mild stroke. Um, refused to go to the hospital because stubborn. And then his health took a downturn at the end of January and he once again refused to go to the hospital, which was probably for the best. Um, hospitals during the pandemic are, during a pandemic, are packed, and a lot of hospital related, a lot of hospital deaths during a pandemic actually are not related to the disease, but other. related. Anyways, um, I'm doing fine. My family is doing okay. Um, and I am back to, back on my bullshit. So, um, you'll notice when I switch back to showing the Sims that we're in a different location. I have decided to do a little bit of developing on my sim and have gone to Shang Simla. She's reading a martial arts book. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 10, in which Simarine and Alianora conduct some tests and disturb a wizard. Back in the kitchen, Cimarron and Eleonora quickly determined that the fireproofing spell had indeed worked. First Cimarron, then Eleonora tossed a pinch of fever fuel in the air and recited the spell verse, then put a hand on the can into a candle flame and held it there. Neither was burned at all, though Eleonora claimed that the candle tickled almost as much as the eagle feather had done. How long does the spell last? Eleonora asked. I'm not sure exactly, Simarine said. At least an hour, but I'll have to do some tests to pin it down beyond that. I hope Kazul gets back soon. I want to see if it works with dragon fire. You're going to have Kazul breathe fire at you just to see if the spell works? Alianora said, horrified. What if it doesn't? Then I'll talk to Kazul. And we'll go see Morwen, and the three of us will try to figure out what to change to make the spell work for Dragonfire, too. Don't look at me like that. I'm not going to stand in front of Kazul and have her breathe fire at me. I'll just stick out a finger, the way we did with the candle. <sighs> Hello, person. Okay, that's weird. Hold on. I will come back to that. Okay. Sorry, for a second there I thought that the the Discord that Twitch had changed my settings without my permission. <laughs> okay. Now, where was I? 
sides are really worth Sorry, between the weather and they're doing a lot of work on the on our road, uh, cutting down trees and redoing the curbs, and it's really stir between that and the weather, it's really stirring up my allergies. <clears throat> This was not enough con to convince Alianora, but Samarine was determined. The whole point of trying this spell was to make herself immune to dragon fire. She said, if it doesn't work, I don't want to find out for the first time when one of Kazul's guests gets mad and breathes fire at me because he doesn't like the way I cooked his cherry's jubilee. Alianora had to admit that this was a good point, but she was still disposed to argue. The discussion was cut short by Kazul's return. At first, the dragon was more inclined to agree with Alianora than with Simarine, but after Simarine proved her invulnerability to candle flames, lighted torches, and the fire she had built in the kitchen stove, Kazul agreed to the trial. She insisted, however, on working up to full firepower in gradual stages, and Simarine was forced to agree. Before they began, Samarine threw another pinch of feverfew into the air and recited the couplet again, just to be sure the spell wouldn't wear off in the middle of the test. Then Kazul lowered her head nearly to the ground, and Alianora watched nervously as Samarine lowered her hand slowly into various intensities of dragon flame. Finally, Samarine stood right in front of Kazul while the dragon breathed her hottest. The spell worked perfectly every time. There, Samarine said when Kazul stopped at last. Now we know it works. Aren't you glad? I'm glad, Alionora said fervently, and I hope I never have to watch anything like that again as long as I live. I didn't dare blink for fear you'd go up in smoke while my eyes were closed. Why don't you try it yourself? Samarine said mischievously. No, said Alionora and Kazul together. Watching you was bad enough, Alionora went on with a shudder. I believe it works. I don't see any reason for me to test it. <sighs> Besides, I've done more than enough fire breathing for one day, Kazul added. I'm starting to get overheated. All right, if you don't want to, you don't have to, Simarine said. If we're all done, I'd better, better go tidy up. Alianora stayed to help Samarine finish cleaning up the traces of the spell, by which time she had calmed down considerably and was very nearly her usual self again. Samarine gave her a pouch full of dry, dried fruit with you. Sorry, I have food ordered and... And it is on its way. getting bubble tea and make sure that she's sorry making sure that my sim is okay I have plenty of uh, generic books but Point of fact, I'm going to queue up that. I'll go back to exploring this dungeon in this tomb once I finish reading for the day. Like I said, uh, late breakfast, lunch, <sighs> point of fact, I'm gonna... no, I can hear it. 
Okay, now let's see. Ah, Simmerine gave her a pouch full of dried fever hue before she left and made her recite the words that activated the spell several times to make sure that she had memorized them correctly. Remember, you only have to repeat the first half of the verse to get the spell going. Now that it's been set up, Simmerine said, can you do it? It's only two lines, and they rhyme, Eleonora said, laughing. How could I forget that? My memory isn't that bad. Maybe not, but say it anyway, Simmerine said. Eleonora laughed again and did so. At last, she set off into the tunnels, and Simmerine went back to the main cave to see what Kazul and Roxham had found out about the caves of fire and night. Kazul was somewhat out of temper, and Simmerine thought privately that she had been telling the truth about getting overheated. Rather than annoy the dragon further, Simmerine asked if she could read the book Kazul had borrowed from Morwen. It's in the treasure room, Kazul said. Read it there, and I hope you see something in it that we didn't. Simmerine nodded, picked up her lamp, and hurried off before Kazul could change her mind. The book was lying near a pile of sapphires next to an ornate crown. She picked it up, went over to the table, which was large and very sturdy because it was intended for counting piles of gold and silver coins, and sat down to read. It was even drier and duller than Kazul had said. There were many, a great many mayhaps and perchances and wherefores strung together in long, involved sentences that compared the strange and wonderful things in the caves to obscure philosophical ideas and odd customs from places Simmerine had never heard of. After a few pages, Simmerine put the book down and went, to get, and went and got a quill pen, an ink pot, and some paper so that she could write down the things she thought were important. She didn't want to have to read a journey through the caves of fire and night more than once. Okay, and um, my food should be here fairly soon. Um, it wasn't that far off. Nah, the restaurant is not very far off, so um, I shall return momentarily.
am back. I'm just gonna eat a slice of this egg. Okay. Okay. Go away. And of course, she's gotta move chairs. For the next three days, Samarine spent bits of her spare time in the treasure room taking notes on the De Montmorency. De Montmorency. It took her that long because she could never manage to read for more than a little while without getting so bored that she nearly fell asleep. Her persistence gained her several pages of notes about the caves, but nothing that seemed as if it might be of in particular, particular interest to the wizards. Eleonora came to see her a few days later, looking very cheerful. It worked, she announced as she came into the library where Simmerine was going over her notes. Caridwell's gone. Therendil rescued her just the way you said he would. Good, Simmerine said. I'm glad something is going right. <laughs> What's the problem? Eleonora asked, seating herself on the other side of the table from Simmerine. This... Samarine said, waving at the paper-covered table. Kazula is sure that the key to what the wizards are after is somewhere in that drad dratted book she borrowed from Morwen. I copied out everything that looked interesting, but none of it seems like anything a wizard would care about. How do you know that? Alianora asked curiously. I don't, Samarine said. I'm just guessing. That's the problem. Oh. Alianora picked up the sheet of paper nearest her and frowned at it. What on earth does this mean? Samarine looked at the page Alianora was holding. Thus these caves of fire and night are in some sense indivisible, whereas the caves of chance are, by contrast, individual. Individual. And though it is preposterous to claim that these descriptions are true of either group of caves in their entirety, that's one of the bits I copied word for word. The whole book is like that. I think it means that if I have a piece of something magical from the Caves of Fire and Night, you can use it in a spell as if it were the whole thing. I can see why you wouldn't be sure, Eleonora said. Do you think it would help, if you f help you figure things out if you stop for a while? I have stopped, Samarine pointed out. Or did you have something more specific in mind? I'm almost out of fever for you, Eleonora said, looking down at the table. I was hoping you'd come with me to pick some more. You're almost out, Samarine said in surprise. How did that happen? Eleonora shifted uncomfortably. I've been working that fire's proof spell every hour or so for the past two days, she admitted. Warhog has been getting more and more unpredictable, and I don't feel comfortable otherwise. Holana said visiting yesterday when he came was visiting when, yesterday when he came in, in the middle of the afternoon, and he was roaring and dripping little bits of flame when he breathed. She was terrified, and I don't blame her. And if it weren't for the spell, I'd be scared to death. What's the matter with him? I don't know. He doesn't tell me anything about dragon politics or wizards or what he's been getting so worked up about. He's not like Kazul. Samarine frowned, considering. Maybe Kazul will have some idea what's bothering him. I'll ask her this evening. In the meantime, let's go get that fever few. You're right to say that I could use a break. Oh, good, said Alianora in tones of considerable relief. I've never picked herbs before, and I'm not sure what feverfew looks like. I don't know what I'd have done if you said you couldn't, wouldn't come. Serene put her notes away and got two wicker baskets and a small knife from one of the storage rooms. Up or down? Eleonora asked as they left the cave. Up, Serene said. The other way is the ledge I told you about, and I wouldn't be surprised if bits of it are still invisible. 
The path through the path, paths of silver ice twisted and turned past the openings of other dragons' caves. Most of the rocks around the caves had scorch marks, and Samarine and Alionora didn't see much growing among them. At this rate, we'll have to go nearly all the way to the Enchanted Forest to find any grass, much less herbs. Eleonora complained. Wait a minute. Samarine said, look over there, through that crack in the rocks. Doesn't look that look like something green? Eleonora's eyes followed Samarine's pointing finger. Yes! She said without enthusiasm, it looks green. The rock Samarine had indicated was a large boulder at the bottom of a steep, steep slope. The slope was covered with gravel and looked as if it would be impossible to climb down without skinning a knee or an elbow at the very least. The boulder itself was in two pieces, with just enough space between them for someone to squeeze through, provided the someone was not very large. Come on, let's get a better look, said Samarine. She walked to the edge of the slope and wrapped her skirts tightly around her legs. Then she sat down with her basket in her lap and slid down the slope, raising an enormous cloud of dust and sounding like an avalanche in process. She reached the bottom in safety and stood up, brushing her skirt. The dust was th so thick that she could hardly see. And when she tried to call to Eleonora, she coughed so hard she could barely speak. Simmerine, are you all right? It's just the dust, Simmerine said in a muffled voice. She had taken out her handkerchief and put it over her mouth and nose to keep the dust out. It wasn't perfect, but it helped a great deal. Come on, it's your turn. Are you sure we just shouldn't just go around? Stop stalling, it's not that bad. That's what you say, Eleonora muttered, but she wrapped her skirts around her, clutched her basket, and slid down the slope. She made even more noise than Samarine had. When she got to the bottom, she was coughing and choking. Samarine handed her the handkerchief, and they waited for a moment while the dust settled. Crawling through the split boulder was easier than they expected. The crevice was wider than it had looked from the path, and the bottom of the crack was so full of dust and gravel and dead leaves that it was almost flat. Samarine and Eleonora had to walk single file, and there were one or two spots where they had to turn sideways in order to get through, but it was not really difficult. On the other side of the boulder, the two girls found a lush, green valley. It was bowl-shaped, not very large, but flowers and grasses stood waist-high between the random clumps of bushes that dotted the valley floor. A squirrel, which had been sunning itself on the ledge near the entrance, leaped for a small tree as Samarine and Eleonora appeared. My goodness, Eleonora said, looking around with wide eyes. This place looks as if no one but us has ever been here before. There aren't even any scorch marks on the rocks. Simmerine blinked. Alianora was right. Lichens covered the weathered, weather, covered the weathered gray rocks that rose above the valley, and small plants grew in cracks and crevices and that showed no sign of the touch of dragonfire. That's odd, Zimmerine commented. Why? Eleonora asked. Those mountains aren't tall enough to keep dragons from flying over, and they're right in the middle of the dragon's territory. So why haven't the dragons been here? They usually keep a close eye on everything that belongs to them. Maybe they have been here, but never found anything to breathe fire at, Eleonora said. Well, I'm going to ask Azul about it when I get back, Samarine said as she waded into the grass. Why don't you take that side, and I'll look over there. We'll cover more ground that way. First, you better show me what I'm looking for, Eleonora said apologetically. I'm afraid I couldn't tell Feverfew from Carrots that there was a dragon chasing me, and my life depended on it. Samarine nodded, and they started off. They had not gone far when she saw us 
patch of white button shaped flowers that look for they this words. They had not gone far when she saw a patch of the white button shaped flower she was looking for. Here, she said, showing them to Eleanor. This is feverfew. The younger plants are the best, the ones that haven't blossomed yet. Oh my gosh. Eleanor studied the leaves and flowers with care. I think I'll recognize it now. They cut some of the plants, leaving those that were blooming. You find the next patch, Samarine said as they started off again. Let's try over there. They set, found several more patches of feverfew, and gradually their baskets began to fill. I think this should be enough, Samarine said at last, unless you think... Submarine! Eleonora hissed, clutching at Submarine's arm. There's someone behind that bush! Submarine turned. A dark line snaked through the grass where something large had been had bent and broken the plants in passing. You're right, she said and started forward. Eleonora hung back, still holding Submarine's far arm. You're not going to go look, are you? How else are we going to find out who uh, who it is? Samarine asked reasonably. She shot off Al shook off Eleanor's hand. Quietly, she walked over to the clump of bushes and peered behind it. Eleanor followed with evident reluctance. A man in blue and brown silk robes was crouched on the other side of the bush with his back towards Samarine. He was stuffing saw-edged purple leaves into a small linen bag the size of Samarine's hand. His hair was brown, and on the ground beside him lay a long, polished staff. Anterel? Samarine said in surprise. The man snatched up his staff and straightened as the bee had just stung him. It was indeed Anterel, and he did not look at all pleased to see her. He stuffed the linen bag quickly into his sleeve and said, Princess Samarine, what brings you here? I was about to ask you the same thing. Samarine said, Let's go where they wish, answering to no one, Anterel said, waving his free hand in a lofty manner. Maybe outside the mountains of mourning they do, but around here they have to check with the dragons first, Samarine said. You know nothing of the matter, Anterel said, looking very put out. Samarine, Eleanor's tone was doubtful, do you know this person? Sorry, I should have introduced you. This is Anterel, one of the wizards I told you about. Anterel, this is Princess Eleonora of the Duchy of Toron Marsh. At the moment, she's the princess of Dragon War of the Dragon War Og. Eleonora curtsied, murmuring something polite and inaudible. Anterel, who had stiffened in surprise when he realized that Simarine was not alone, relaxed visibly. War Og's princess? That's all right then. Though he really sh shouldn't have sent you. But Warhog didn't. Ow! said Eleonora. The ow was because Samarine had hastily kicked her ankle and to keep her from telling Anterel too much. Didn't what? Anterel asked, frowning suspiciously. Didn't know you were going to be here, Aunt Samarine said. Well, of course he didn't know, Anterel said, looking annoyed. That's the whole point, after all. Samarine would have very much liked to ask him what the point was, but she was afraid it would make him suspicious again. I don't understand, she said instead, batting her eyes at him. Of course not. 
Antero replied in a condescending tone that made Cimmerine's teeth hurt. But it doesn't matter. I'm not annoyed with you. I'm so glad. Cimmerine murmured. Antarel gave her an oily smile. In fact, there's no need for you to tell Warog that he met me here. I wouldn't dream of it. Cimmerine said with perfect truth. Excellent. Then may I escort the two of you back to the path? Eleonora looked hopefully in Cimmerine's direction. But we can't leave yet, Cimmerine said, opening her eyes very wide. We haven't picked any cornflowers or daisies. Behind her, she heard Alianora making a smothered, choking noise, as if she were trying very hard not to laugh. Daisies, Antarell said in a flat and credulous tone. You want to stay and pick daisies. Samarine nodded vigorously. And cornflowers and flax and all sorts of things, she said, waving her hand at the flowers blooming all around. They look so pretty in a bowl of water in the kitchen. I'm sure you're right, Antarell said. He looked as if he could, would have liked the sub to object, but couldn't think of anything to object to. Perhaps I could help you, he said reluctantly. Oh, we wouldn't dream of keeping you, Samarine said. Antarell was clearly reluctant to leave the two girls in the valley, but Samarine did not give him much choice. After another minute or two of, or so of conversation, the wizard was forced to go. He did not use a vanishing spell, but trudged away on foot. Cimmerine watched him until he was out of sight among the bushes, wondering whether he had some special reason not to use spells in the valley, or whether he simply didn't know the right spells to make himself vanish. That's a relief, Eleanor said. Why did you insist on staying when it was so obvious that he wanted us to leave? I was afraid he was going to turn us into toads or something. I wanted to see what he was up to, Submarine said, and I don't think Antarell is a very good wizard. He probably could manage anything worse than a squirrel. Eleonora did not appear to find this very reassuring. Submarine checked the, to make sure Antarell was out of sight, then went over to the place where she, he had been standing when, he, when she peered around the bush. At first, she did not notice anything unusual. Then she saw a purplish plant oozing sap from the places where several of its spiky, sawtooth leaves had been broken off. Look at this. What is it? Eleonora asked. I don't know. I saw a couple of other plants like this while we were picking Feverfew, but I thought they were just weeds. Maybe it is a weed. A wizard wouldn't sneak into the dragon section of Mountains of Morning just to pick weeds. They don't even use herbs to cast spells. So what does Antarell want with this prickly looking thing? Eleonora shrugged. Maybe he needs it for something he can't do with magic. I wonder what that would be. Submarine so reached out and carefully broke off a spray of leaves. She wrapped them in her handkerchief and put the packet in her pocket. Let's see if we can find out whether, the, whether he picked anything else. Antarell had left a dark trail of bent and broken plants to mark the way he had come, so his path was easy to follow. Samarine and Alianora searched carefully along it for some way, for some way, looking for signs that the wizard had picked other herbs, but neither of them saw any. I don't think there's anything to find, Alianora said, pushing her apricot colored hair out of her face. And it's getting awfully warm. Have you noticed that there aren't any of those purple plants along here? Samarina said. I'll bet that was all he wanted. Then let's leave before that wizard thinks to circle around and check on what we're doing. Samar Alianora urged. Samarina doubted that Antarell would think of doing such a thing, but she nodded in agreement and the two girls left the valley. Eleonora was quiet and thoughtful for most of the walk back through Kazul's cave. Cimmerine was grateful for her silence. She had a lot to think about herself. From what Antarell had said, it seemed likely that Warog was helping the wizard somehow. Or at least that he had known what Antarell was looking for in the little valley. 
difficult to imagine a dragon helping a wizard, but she couldn't say with certainty that it was impossible. And if Warrock was, in was involved with Antarell and Ziminar, it might explain why he had been so touchy lately. When they arrived back at the cave, Apparently, she has finished her cue. When they... Okay, top of the page. Had to set her up with more books. When they arrived back at the cave, Simarine shook herself free of her preoccupation. She and Alianora unloaded their baskets and tied the herbs in bunches that to hang in the dark corner of the kitchen to dry. How long will it be before I can use the fever for you? Alianora asked worriedly. I'm not sure, Simarine said in a considering tone. It will take at least a week to dry thoroughly. It, but you might be able to use it in the spell before then. The directions don't say how dry the fever few has to be. We could try it every day with a pinch of leaves from one of these bunches if you like. Alianor nodded. I really do need it. I wonder if it work, would work without being dried. Samarine said. She pulled a leaf from one of the hanging plants and shredded it carefully between her fingers, then tossed it up in the air and recited the rhyme. There. Now light a candle or a, another lamp or something. Eleanor had already lit a, lit a candle and set it on the table. Samarine moved over and stuck her finger in the flame. I think it's working, she said, and moved the rest of her hand closer. The sleeve of her dress caught fire. Samarine hastily pulled her hand away from the candle and slapped at the flames, while Eleanor snatched up a bucket of water from beside the sink and poured it over Samarine's arm. The fire went out, and so did the candle, and both Simarine and Eleonora got thoroughly soaked. Oh dear, Eleonora said, ignoring her soggy skirts. Simarine, did you burn yourself? No, Simarine said, looking at her arm with a puzzled expression. I didn't feel a thing. I thought the spell worked, but nothing caught fire when we tested it before. It must be because the fever fuel was fresh instead of dried, and I had hoped that I'd be able to use it right away. If they're that low on dried fever, if you take some of mine, Samarine so offered. The console's not particularly irritable, and I only need to keep a pinch or two in case of emergencies. Thank you, Alianora said fervently, and Samarine so turned her soggy cuffs back and went to the, get the bottled spices. Chapter 11, in which Kazul is unwell and Simarine makes a new acquaintance. Eleonora decided to return home by way of the path outside instead of through the tunnels because it was such a nice day, and she hoped the sun would dry her skirt. Simarine watched her go, swinging her basket happily and humming a little, her confidence and good humor completely restored by the possession of the fat little packet of dried fever fuel in her pocket. I wish I had as little to worry about. 
Mr. Marine muttered, thinking of Warog and the wizards. She held the burn patch at the end of her sleeve up to get a better look at, look at it in the sunlight, and shook her head. Even the magic wardrobe would have a hard time fixing that. A puff of wind made her shiver in her wet clothes, and she turned back to the, into the cave to change. A dark shadow fell over Samarine, and she stopped looking up and looked up. Kazool, she said as the dragon landed in the open path beside her. Am I glad to see you. Wait until you hear what's been happening. You do appear to have had a rather strenuous day, Kazool said, eyeing Samarine's wet, stained skirt and the blackened end of her right sleeve. Nothing serious, I trust. I'm not sure, Samarine said. Alianora and I, and I went out to pick some fever few, and we ran into that wizard Antarel. Where was this? Samarine pointed. Up that way, there's a little round valley off to one side that looks as if dragons never go there. And you found a wizard there? Oh, you found a wizard there? Kazul sounded deeply concerned. How did you get in? How did you get in? We climbed through a crack in a boulder. I don't know how, Simarine said, I don't know how Antarel did it. When he left, he was heading for the far side of the valley. This is serious, Kazul said, getting to her feet. I'd better warn the king. He'll have to use the crystal now. You'd better hear the rest of it first, Simarine said. Antarel wasn't too happy to see us, but when he found out that Alianora was Warog's princess, he relaxed. He seemed to think that Warog had sent us. What? Samarine involuntarily stepped back a pace at the anger in Kazul's voice. He thought Warog had sent us. She repeated and gave a quick summary of her conversation with Antarel. Warog! Kazul's tail lashed, sweeping a small boulder from one side of the path to the other. But Warog's not a fool, and only a fool would let a, let a wizard into that valley. Unless he was sure that they didn't know. What was Antarel doing? Cutting plants, Simarine said. Or rather, cutting a plant. It didn't look as if he took more than one. He wouldn't need more than one if it was the right one. Kuzul said tensely. What did he pick? It was a prickly looking purple thing with saw edged leaves, Simarine said, reaching into her pocket. I didn't recognize it, but I thought you might. So I brought a piece back for you to look. What? Kazul roared. Flames spurted from the dragon's mouth, enveloping Simarine. Steam hissed from her white skirt, and the thinner material of her sleeves vanished in a crackle of sparks. The handkerchief wrapped spray of purple leaves which she had just taken out of her pocket to show Kazool, disintegrated into a dark, greasy-looking cloud of smoke. Simarine stared at the ashes in her palm, feeling very, very glad that she had decided to test the way fresh fever few would work in the fire-breathing spell. She felt a little warm, and her clothes had been reduced to a few charred rags, but that was nothing compared to what might have happened. Now I understand why Eleanor ran out of fever few, she muttered. A puff of wind brushed Samarine's arm, and she heard a choking sound from Kazul. She looked up, expecting to find dragon, the dragon laughing at her remark, and her eyes widened. Kazul's head was thrown back, and her mouth was wide open, giving Samarine an excellent view of the dragon's sharp silver teeth and long red tongue. Simarine skipped a few skipped backward out of reach. Then she realized that the dragon was gasping for air. Kazool, what's the matter? The smoke Kazool coughed. Her voice was so hoarse that it was hard for Simarine to understand what she was saying. What can I do? Simarine said, trying not to feel frightened. Reach our shelf in the last treasure room. Kazool managed between coughs. Hurry! Simarine was already running through the mouth of the cave as fast as her feet could carry her. She did not even pause as she snatched up her lamp from the floor just inside the door. 
It seemed to take forever to get through the twisty passages in the first few first two caves full of treasure. She skidded to a halt in the doorway of the third room and stood panting, scanning the walls for the shelf in the right jar. She found it quickly and ran back at once. The jar clutched tightly in her right hand. The sound of Gazul's coffee grew louder as Simmering sped back the way she had come. At the mouth of the cave, Simmering paused and set down the lamp, then unscrewed the top of the green jar. Inside was a thick, emerald-colored liquid about the consistency of honey. She looked at Kazul, the dragon's head jerked with each cough, and the scales on her neck were beginning to turn pink around the edges. For a long, careful moment, Simmering studied Kazul's moment, movements. Then she leaned back and threw the emerald liquid, jar and all, into the dragon's open mouth just as Kazul took another gasping breath. The jar landed on Kazul's tongue, the dragon's, mouth, the dragon's mouth closed, and she swallowed convulsively. Sudden silence descended. Are you all right now? Zimrine asked after Kazul had taken several deep breaths without a renewed bout of coughing. I will be, Kazul said. She sounded exhausting, exhausted, and her movements as she slid into the cave were slow and uncertain. What happened? Zimrine said, backing out of the way so that Kazul would not have to exert herself to go around. I got a breath of the smoke when the plant in your hand burned. <sighs> Why are you like this computer? I didn't let it idle for very long. Kazul said as she settled to the floor just inside the entrance. Lucky it was only a breath. I'll need a few days of rest, but that's better than being dead. Simmerine stared at her, appalled. What was that plant? Dragon's Bane, said Kazul. Her eyes closed, and she slept. Kazul con continued to sleep for the most of the next three days. She woke only long enough for Simmerine to pour a couple of gallons of warm milk mixed with honey down her throat from time to time before she lapsed back into an unconsciousness. Simrine was very worried, but there wasn't much she could do. Sick dragons are too large and heavy for normal nursing to be of much use. On the afternoon of the third day, Kazul woke up completely for the first time since her collapse. Thank goodness, said Simrine as Kazul shook her head experimentally and sat up. I was beginning to think you were going to sleep for a month. I might have if I hadn't gotten more than a whiff of that smoke. Kazul stretched her neck in one direction and her tail in another, trying to work out some of the kinks. If I'd known it was so dangerous, I'd never have brought any of that purple plant back with me, Simmerine apologized. You might have done worse than sleep for a month. You might have... She stopped, unwilling to complete the thought. I might have died? Kuzul said, unlikely. If a dragon isn't killed outright by something in the first five minutes, recovery is only a matter of time. That applies as much to Dragon's Bane as to a knight's magic sword. Then why did you want that goo in the green jar? The antidote? I wanted it because I didn't like the idea of spending a month recuperating when I didn't have to. And since, a fit of coughing interrupted Kuzul in mid-sentence. Sermarine skipped backward out of the way. Frowning worriedly, she tossed a pinch of few pew into the air and recited the verse from the fire creepy spell, in case Kazul would lose control of her flame again. Maybe you won't need a month to recover, but three days obviously isn't enough, she said to the dragon. You better lie back down before you choke. I can't, Kazul said. I have to warn the king. If the wizards have had Dragonbane for three days already, she started coughing again and had to stop talking. You stay here, Simmerian said in a firm tone. I'll warn the king. Tokos won't listen to you, Kazul said, but she said, but she settled back to the ground. Roxim will, though. Start with him. Roxim, Simmerian said doubtfully. 
She was afraid the great green dragon would want to go charging out after the wizards as soon as he heard they were up to something. He'll listen to you, and the king will listen to him. It's not ideal, but it's the best we can do. Kazul said. All right, I'll go see Roxham. You stay here and sleep. When you get back, I'll wake you and tell you what he said, Samarine promised. Now go to sleep. Kazul smiled slightly and closed her eyes. Samarine caught up a lamp and almost ran to the exit at the back of the cave. She was afraid that Kazul would think of something else and start talking again, and she didn't think talking would be good for her. In the tunnel outside, Samarine paused, trying to remember the directions to Roxanne's cave. She had memorized the lap, a map in the library that showed most of the twists and turns of the dragon's tunnels. But she knew from experience that in the miles of gray stone corridors, it was difficult to treat, keep track of where she was. Left, left, fifth, right. Past the little chamber, right again. On past the iron gate. Two lefts to the third cave down. She muttered to herself, I wish Roxen cave, Roxen's cave were closer. Still muttering, she started off. Though she was being very careful, Simmerine had to backtrack twice during the first part of her trip, when a mistake in counting corridors led her to a dead end. When she finally saw the iron gate that led into the cave's fire at night, she sighed in relief. The tricky part was over, and the rest of the trip would be easy. She held her lamp up and quickened her step, hoping to make some of the time she had lost on her detours. And then, as she reached the bars that blocked the entrance to the caves of fire and night, she stopped short. There was someone sitting on the ground on the other side of the gate. Samarine had almost missed seeing him, and no wonder his clothes, though well cut, were the same dark gray as the stone of the tunnel walls. And he was curled into a lumpy, dejected ball. He looked like a large rock. If he hadn't moved his hand as she passed, Samarine would never have realized he was alive. The man on the other side of the bars raised his head, and Samarine saw with shock that his hair and skin were the same dark, even gray as his clothes. His eyes, too, were gray, and their expression was apologetic. Forgive me for startling you, the man said, climbing ponderously to his feet. I didn't see you coming. He made a stiff, formal bow. Who are you? Samarine demanded. And what are you doing in there? I'm a prince, the man said in a gloomy tone. And I'm reaping the rewards of my folly. What folly? The prince sighed. It's a long story. Somehow they always seem to be long. Samarine said. You haven't come to rescue me from the dragons, have you? Because if you have, I'm not going to let you out of there. I haven't got time to spend an hour arguing today. I have no interest whatever in dragons, I assure you, the prince said earnestly. And if you would let me out, I'd be extremely grateful. Um, who are you, by the way? Simmerine, princess of the dragon school. Samarine said. She studied the prince for a moment and decided that he looked trustworthy. All right, I'll let you out. Turn around and put your ears in your fingers in your ears. What? The prince said, looking considerably startled. It's part of the spell to open the gate. Samarine said. She wasn't about to let him overhear the words Kazul had used to unlock the door, even if he did look trustworthy. The prince shrugged and did as she directed. Quickly, Samarine recited, By night and flame and shining rock, open now thy hidden lock. Alborolingarn. For an instant, nothing happened, and Samarine was afraid she had not remembered the charm correctly. Then the iron gate swung silently open. The prince, whose back was to the gate, did not notice. Samarine touched his shoulder to get his attention, and her eyes widened. Oh, she said as he turned, you're, you're stone. I know, the prince said. 
It's part of that long story I mentioned earlier. I haven't gotten used to it yet. She stepped, he stepped through the gate and it closed noiselessly behind him. I'm afraid I don't have to, time to listen to stories just now, Samarine said politely. I have a rather urgent errand to run, so if you'll excuse me, can't I come with you? Samarine stared at him. Why do you want to do that? The stone prince looked down at his feet with an embarrassed expression. Um, well, actually, I'm lost. And you seem to know your way around down here. He glanced hopefully at Samarine's face, then sighed. I suppose I can just wander around some more. I'll have to find a way out eventually. You'll run into a dragon and get eaten. I don't think it will hurt stone, the prince said. He sounded almost cheerful, as if he had only just realized that being made of stone might have some advantages. Maybe not, but you're sure to give the dragon indigestion. Samarine said, Father, I don't have time for this. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, cramp. I could wait here if you're coming that back this way, the stone prince suggested. Samarine brightened, then frowned and shook her head. No, one of the dragons might need to go into the caves of fire and night, or it might turn off one it might be the turn of one of those dread wizards. You can't stay here. Then I know. You can wait in the serving room just off the banquet hall. It's close. There's plenty of room, and I know no one's using it today, because I checked the schedule for, for Eleonora yesterday. I can take a shortcut out the back and get to Roxanne's Cave without losing any more time. Come on. I really appreciate this, the Stone Prince said as they started off. You don't know what it's like being lost in the dark in these caves. How did it happen? Samarine asked. The stone prince's expression became gloomy once more. It was all it's all that soothsayer's fault, he said. Soothsayer. My father didn't think it was appropriate to invite a fairies to a prince's christening. So he invited a soothsayer instead, the prince replied. The soothsayer took one look at me and said that I would grow up to do a great service for a king. I've been stuck with this blasted prophecy with his blasted prophecy ever since. Doesn't sound so terrible to me, Samarine said. It wasn't at first, the Stone Prince admitted. I had special tutors and all sorts of interesting things to prepare me for being of great service to a king. My father even sent me to a special school for people who were supposed to do special things. Did you do well? I was the top of my class. The stone prince said with a flash of pride. His face fell again. That's part of the problem. I don't understand, Samarine said. This way. And you can walk can you walk a little faster, please? I'm in a hurry. It's been three years since I graduated, and everyone's still waiting for me to do something spectacular, the stone prince said, lengthening his stride. The rest of my classmates are already making names for themselves. George started killing dragons right away, and Art seemed, went straight home and pulled some sort of magic sword out of a rock. Even the ones nobody expected to amount to much have done something. All Jack wanted to do was back, go back to his mother's farm and graze beans, and he ended up stealing a magic harp and killing a giant and all sorts of things. I'm the only one who hasn't succeeded. Why not? The stone prince sighed again. I don't know. At first it seemed as if I wouldn't have any any trouble finding a king to serve. 
And every time there was a war, both kings asked me to lead their armies, and every king for miles around who'd lost his throne to a usurper sent a message to my father's court. It should have been simple. Only they were always so worried about whether I was going to side with their enemies that it was easier not to pick anyone. I see, said Samarine. Privately, she thought the stone prince had been rather wishy-washy. <sighs> no, itchy. Some of her opinion must have crept into her tone because the stone prince glum nodded glumly. You're right. It was a was a mistake. As long as I didn't pick a king to serve, all the messengers and ambassadors and envoys stayed, hoping to persuade me. The inns around the castle were stuffed with them. It got to the point where I couldn't show my face without at least three of them pouncing on me. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore and I ran away. It was a relief at first, not having everyone hovering over me waiting for me to make do something great. But after a while, I started feeling uncomfortable. Then I realized that even if nobody around me expected me to do some, anything special in the service of the king, I expected me to do something. I was so flustered that I ran up to the next palace I saw and asked whether the king needed any services done. It turned out that he was ill, and his doctors had told him that the only thing that would cure him was a drink of the water of healing from the caves of fire and night. So I left to get it at once. So that's what you were doing, Simmerine said. A stone prince gave her another gloomy nod. I should have known better. The king has three sons, and the first two had already gone off to the water and failed. Anyone with sense would have seen that the youngest son would, was the one who would succeed. It sticks out all over. But I was too eager to do my great service that, and get it over with. And I didn't stop and think. What happened? It took me a long time to find the caves of fire at night, but once I did, it wasn't hard to find the water of healing. The chamber's getting crowded. All the princes who have tried to get the water and failed have been turned into slabs of rock. I know. I've seen them. Simmerine said, Watch out for your head. The ceiling's low along here. Then you know what it's like. And you've seen the two dippers on the wall by the spring? The stone prince's shoulders sagged. I knew I should use the tin one. It was I, it was the one one of the first things we learned at school. But I thought it wouldn't do any harm if I just looked at the gold one. So I took it off the off the wall. And as soon as I touched it, I started to stiffen up. Um said Samarine. The stone prince was obviously well aware of how foolishly he behaved. She saw no reason to make him feel worse by pointing it out to him again. So I stuck my arm in the spring. The prince said, You stuck your arm? Oh, I see. That was clever. Samarine said. Do you really think so? The stone prince asked anxiously. I thought that since the water from the spring was going to turn all the slabs of stone back into princes when someone finally succeeds in the quest, when the water ought to, then the water ought to keep me from turning into a slab of stone in the first place. Only it didn't work the way I expected. He finished dis disconsolately. I didn't know that was a word. I can see that, Zimmerine said. But at least you can still do things. It would be much worse to have to lie there waiting for the right prince to come along and break the spell. I wouldn't have had to lie there very long, the, prince, the stone prince said. That king's youngest son is going to arrive any day now. I just know it. Anyway, if I were a slab of stone, I wouldn't know about it until it was all over and I'd been turned back into a prince again. How do you know? Samarine demanded. Have you ever been a stone slab? The stone prince looked startled. No, I haven't. I never thought of that. Well, start thinking now. Samarine said tartly. Here's the surface room. Wait here for me and don't go wandering off till I till I'm if I'm late getting back. 
I don't know how long this errand is going to take, and it would be very awkward for me if the dragons found you roaming through their tunnels. I'll remember, the stone prince promised. But what if I, what do I do if I, if someone comes in? Duck into the banquet area, Simarine said, showing him. And if someone comes in there too, curl up into, in the corner and pretend you're a rock. All right, the prince said doubtfully. Samri did not like leaving him, but she was even less enthusiastic about taking him to see Roxen. Roxen probably wouldn't object to the prince himself, though Samri suspected that there might have been some difficulty over the, his proposed theft of the water of healing. But explaining everything to the Grey Green Dragon would take hours. Roxen was nice, but he tended to take a simple view of things, and the prince's situation was anything but simple. So Simmering gave the prince one more warning, just to make sure he understood, and started off towards Roxanne's cave to finish her errand. Okay, one more drink. Chapter 12, in which the marine calls on a dragon and the stone prince discovers a plot. The short cut to Roxanne's cave worked just as well as the marine had hoped, and she even made up some of the time she had lost earlier. Roxanne was in, too. She could hear the scraping of his scales as he moved around inside. She stepped up to the entrance of the cave and called, Dragon Roxanne! Something round and shiny flew and flew through the air, missing Simmerine by inches. It hit the wall of the tunnel with a loud clang and slid rattling to the floor. Simmerine jumped. Roxim! she shouted at the top of her lungs. What's this? The dragon said, poking his nose out of the cave entrance. I am Simmerine, princess of the dragon Fazul, and I offer you greetings and good fortune in all your endeavors. Samarine thought it best to be particularly polite in case Roxen were in a bad mood. She suspected he might be. In her experience, someone in a good mood did not throw things at visitors. Very good, Roxen said. Nice to see you again and all that. But I haven't got time for visitors at the moment, sorry. I'm not a visitor exactly. Kazul sent me with a message for you. Oh, well that's different. Just hand me that shield there, will you? Simmerine picked up the shield from the floor of the tunnel. There was a large dent in one side where it had hit the tunnel wall, and several sm smaller ones over the rest of it from banging against things on its way to the tunnel floor. You ought to be more careful, she said severely. Just look at this. Ha! Roxanne snorted, examining the dent. Shoddy work, shoddy work. That's the problem. In my day, you could roll a knight in full armor down the far side of a vanishing mountain and bounce him off two or three cliffs without so much as scratching his surface, much less denting it. This cheap modern stuff just doesn't hold up. He sounds like old people talking about comparing old cars to modern cars. I mean, I'm just thinking, knowing how, knowing my, for my, knowing what I know about shoddy work with modern vehicles. Just because the armor is not dented doesn't mean the night's okay. <laughs>
If you know it doesn't hold up, you shouldn't throw it around like that, Simarine said. You almost hit me. Roxum shifted uncomfortably. Sorry, didn't mean anything by it. All right, but next time look before you throw things, Simarine said, handing him the shield. Little princess. Chastising big dragon. <laughs> I always have this problem when I try to find something, Roxum confided. Never know where to look. It gets frustrating. And next thing you know, I'm pitching armor at the walls. Bad habit, but hard to break. Maybe I could help, Samarine suggested. After I give you Kazul's message, that is. Don't need help to put dents in things, Roxum said. It comes to that, I don't really want it. I didn't mean help throw things, Simarine said patiently. I meant help find whatever you're looking for. What well, that? Well, come on in then. Simarine followed the dragon into a moderately large cave similar to the one Kuzul used as a living area. Roxum's cave, however, was full of clutter. Simarine had to pick her way past bits of armor, one half of a pair of bookends, a box of tea, a pink scroll, three mismatched kitchen pots, a small wooden statue, a broken flute, and four partially burnt candles. Roxon walked straight over the mess as if it weren't there, squashing a mangy-looking stuffed pigeon and flattening a tin cup in passing. He dropped the shield on a pile of silk flowers and waved Simmerine to a seat on a large wooden chest near one wall. Now, what's this message of Kazul? It's about the wizards, Simarine said, settling gingerly on the dusty surface of the chest. She made a mental note to find Broxum a nice princess as soon as she possibly could. Alianora and I found one of them picking Dragon's Bane a few days ago. And Kazul thinks King Tokos will listen to you if you tell him about it. So that's where they got it. Roxum said in tones of disgust. Pity you didn't mention it sooner. Simmering got a sinking feeling. What do you mean? Somebody poisoned King Tokos this morning. Roxum explained. Slipped some dragon's bane in his coffee. Fast acting. Nothing to be done. Now we need a new king. That's awful. Simmering said. Do you know who did it? Those dratted wizards, that's who, Roxon said angrily. It's obvious. Stupid thing to do. Has to be the wizards by George. But Warog won't listen to me. Warog? What's Warog got to do with it? He's in charge of the ex investigation, Roxon replied. Taking his time about it, too, if you ask me. But if the king was only poisoned this morning... What does that have to do with it? Roxum said unreasonably. Besides, if Orog doesn't hurry, he won't have the culprit in hand by the time the trials start tomorrow. Trials? You mean with Calm and Stone to choose the new king? Simarine said with some hesitation. She did not see how it could be a trial for the person who could, had killed the, the king if they hadn't caught him yet. But she was not completely certain that the dragons didn't have some way of getting around the problem and trying him anyway. That's it, Roxon said, pleased. And before I leave, I have to find that emerald I picked up 50 years ago. Coronation present for the new king. But you haven't got a new king yet, Simmerine said, feeling somewhat bewildered. And what if you're the king? Roxon smiled king broadly. You were a nice girl, a nice gal. Me... The king. I rather like the idea. I still have to find the emerald, though. Wouldn't do to show up at the trials without a coronation present. Rum thing to do. Overconfident. Though she was upset more than a, and more than a little worried, Simarine helped Roxon as best as he could. As best she could. After about an hour of poking through the clutter, Simarine found the emerald wrapped in a gold embroidered handkerchief and stuffed into the mouth of a large brass horn. Roxon thanked her and invited her to take tea, but Simmerine politely declined. She was eager to get back to Kazul to tell her what happened and decide what to do next. 
Mr. Moon hurried back to Kazool's cave by the shortest route, thinking so hard about Tokos' death that she forgot everything else. She found Kazool sleeping and was forced to wake her, despite her worries about the dragon's health. She knew Kazool would want to hear about the King of the Dragons as soon as possible, and she wanted to hear what Kazool made of Warog's involvement in the investigation. Back already, Kazool said, opening her eyes. Did Roxen get you in to see King Tokos? No, Simarine said. She hesitated, uncertain of the best way to break the news. It was too late. Too late? Kazool raised her head, startled. She eyed Simarine briefly and then said, All right, let's have it. What happened? King Tokos was poisoned this morning. Roxen said that someone put Dragon's Bane in his coffee. Kazool snorted. Somebody knew Tokos pretty well. Seeing Simarine's surprised expression, she explained, Tokos drank Turkish coffee every morning. The stuff is strong enough to take the roof off your mouth. That's why no one ever went to talk to him over breakfast. You could boil a whole field's worth of dragon's bane in co Turkish coffee without changing the taste enough to notice. Or the texture. Simarine tried to imagine coffee, even Turkish coffee, strong enough to take the roof off a dragon's mouth and failed. I told Roxim about the wizard Alionora and I met, and Roxim said I ought to tell Warog before, because Warog is in charge of finding the poisoner, she said. But, but when you caught Antorell picking Dragon's Bane, he thought Warog had sent you, Kazul said. If Warog's mixed up with the wizards. She broke off, coughing. Simarine watched her anxiously. But the coughing spasm did not last long. I don't like this. Kazool finished when she got her breath back. I don't either, Simarine agreed. But what can we do about it? Kazool frowned and said nothing. For several minutes, the two sat and thought in silence. Then Kazool said, we can't do anything until the new king has been chosen. Did Roxen say when the testing will be? Tomorrow, Simarine said. Tomorrow? Kazul surged to her feet. Why didn't you say so at once? If I'm to be at the Fort of Whispering Snakes tomorrow, I have to lie down, Simarine commanded. Kazul looked at her in surprise and collapsed in another fit of coughing. Simarine waited until the dragon's coughing had subsided, then said sternly, You're in no condition to go hauling rocks all over the countryside. I'd be surprised if you can even fly as far as the end of the pass. I think you're going to have to give up on the trials this time around. Kuzul made a choking noise. Simarine looked at her in alarm, then realized the dragon was laughing. That's not optional, princess, Kuzul said. All the adult dragons in the Mountain of Mourning are required to show up, no matter what condition they're in. But... There's no acceptable excuse for missing the testing of a new king, Kazul repeated. None, and I have a great deal to do before I leave. So if you, if anything needs to be done around here, I'll do it, Simarine said firmly. If you don't rest, you won't be able to fly at all. And then how will you get to the ford? A reasonable point, Kazul said, settling reluctantly and back into place. Very well. The first thing I need is a coronation present for the new king. There's a jewel helmet in the, on a shelf in the second storeroom that might do. Bring it out so I can take a look at it. Simarine spent the rest of the evening running errands for Kazul. Besides choosing a coronation gift, Kazul rejected the helmet and two crowns before deciding on a scepter made of gold and crystal. Innumerable message had, messages had to be delivered to various dragons who were in charge of arranging the trials. This one had to be informed of Kazul's ill health so that it could be taken into account when the order of testing was established. That one had to be told that Kazul would not be able to join the coronation process, pr procession. 
Substitutes had to be found to perform Fazul's various ceremonial duties. Then their names had to be approved by a surly dragon in charge of protocol. And finally, the substitutions had to be recorded on all the lists of, the, of all the dragons who were managing each of the events. They reminded Simeon strongly of Linderwall and her parents' court. By the time the last arrangement had been made and the last message delivered, it was very late and Simeon was exhausted. She was also very glad she had not let Kazul do all the running around. The dragon, who had slept most of the time Simeon was out, was looking much be better, even in the dim light of Simeon's lamp. Tired but satisfied, Simeon went to her room and dropped onto the bed. Simeon was up to up early the next morning, stirring a dozen ostrich eggs in a large iron kettle for Kazul's breakfast. Kazul ate all of them, then slid out of the cave pre and prepared to leave for the fort of Whispering Spring Snakes. Don't fret, princess, Kazul said. The testing doesn't start until ten. I have plenty of time to get there, even if I stop to rest now and then. Her voice sounded much better than it had the day before, and it no longer seemed to rasp her throat. While I'm gone, why don't you visit Warog's princess? See if she's noticed anything odd these past few days. We need to know as much as we can before we talk to the new king about Warog and the wizards. All right, Samarine said, as soon as I'm done with the dishes. Kazul turned and leaped into the air, her wings churning clouds of dust from the dry surface of the ground. Simarine squinted after her and shouted, Good luck! Kazul's wings dipped in answer before the dragon soared out of sight beyond the shoulder of the next mountain. Simarine stood looking after Kazul, her forehead wrinkling in worry. After a moment, she shook herself and went inside. She had work to do. Washing the dishes did not take long, and as soon as she was done, Samarine set off to visit Alianora. Alianora. The tunnels and passageways were silent and empty, and Samarine's footsteps echoed eerily through the darkness. She began to wish she had taken a longer route along the outside of the mountain. She had not realized that the Dragon City would seem so strange and lifeless with all the dragons gone. Psst! Samarine! Simmerine jumped. She whirled in the direction of the voice, raising her lamp like a club, and Alianora stepped out of the adjoining tunnel and into the circle of light. In one hand, she clutched a large bucket, three quarters full of soapy water, and she looked rather pale. Alianora, Simmerine said, lowering her arm. What are you doing out here? Shh, Alianora said. She looked nervously over her shoulder. Warog told me to scrub off the table in the banquet room while everyone was away, and, and I heard someone moving around in there. Even though everyone but us is gone, and I dropped my lamp, and oh my goodness, Simmerine said, the Stone Prince, I'd forgotten all about him. Who? The Stone Prince. Quickly, Simmerine explained how she had found and hidden him the day before, and if I, and I hadn't thought about it until now. But this is the perfect time to get him out of the mountains, she finished. All the dragons are gone, and no one will see him. Come on, before I forget again. Alianora Dot nodded dubiously, and the two girls headed for the banquet room. When they arrived, Simmerine went in first, holding her lamp high. Prince! Are you in here? It's me, Simmerine. Yes, I'm here, said the prince, unfolding stiffly from the gray lump in the corner. I'm glad you're back. Who's this you brought with you? Princess Alianora of the Duchy of Toron Marsh, Simmerine said. She's the princess of the Dragon Warog just now. Does her father need a great service done for him? The prince asked, hopefully. Not that I know of. Samarine replied, unless you're good at getting rid of aunts, but that would be more of a service to Alianora than her father. I can think of nothing that would make me happier, the prince said with evident admiration as he bowed stiffly to Alianora. Good afternoon, princess, or should it be good evening? 
It's hard to tell without windows. Eleonora blushed and looked down at her bucket without answering. She got a crutch. Actually, it's good morning, Serene told the prince. I'm sorry it took me so long to come back for you, but, well, a lot has been going on. Eleonora looked up sharply. You've been sitting here in the dark all night? She shuddered. You could have at least le could at least have let him, left him a candle, Summerine. Thank you for the thought, Princess Eleonora, but it's just as well she didn't. The Stone Prince said, "If I'd been sitting here with a lit candle, they'd have noticed me right away. And an unlit candle isn't much use in the dark, is it?" What do you mean, Summerine said? Who would have noticed you? The dragon and the two men he was talking to. I think they replied the prince. I think they were wizards. What? said Cimmerine and Alianora together. Well, they talked as if they were wizards, the wood prince said. They weren't carrying staffs, though. What did they look like? Cimmerine said. They were both tall, and they both had beards. The older ones was gray, and the younger ones was brown. Antarell and Ziminar, Cimmerine said. And they were talking to a dragon. The stone prince nodded. Then they wouldn't have been carrying staffs. Dragons are allergic to them. Did you hear what they said? Something about a contest, the stone prince said. The wizards were going to fix it so this dragon could win. It sounded like a kind of cross-country race, and the wizards were going to hide along the path and, and help the dragon out somehow. I'm afraid I'm not very clear about that part. Spells aren't my specialty. I'm much better at hopeless causes. Alianor and Cimmerine exchanged appalled glances. The trials with calm stones to pick out the new king of the new king, Alianor said. Which dragon? Cimmerine said, asked urgently. Do you know which dragon they were talking to? I only heard the name once, the prince said. He sounded apologetic and a little embarrassed, and I don't think I got it right. It's too silly. Tell us. Simone commanded. Well, it sounded like Warthog, the prince said, in an even more apologetic tone than before. Could it have been Warog? Simone asked. That's it, the prince said. I knew it could not really have been Warthog. What a pity you remembered, said a voice from the entrance into the banquet hall. Cimmerine whirled. Antarell stood in the doorway, staff in hand, watching them with an intolerably smug expression. And I'm going to leave that to ruminate because that is the end of chapter 12. And as we all know, I do three chapters a day, three chapters a week. Um, uh, so, I really don't have any announcements other than, um, yeah, I mean, that, that I really don't have any announcements. Um, so, I will leave that with a pace.